In April 1970, Keith Emerson, formerly of The Nice, and Greg Lake from King Crimson formed a band with Carl Palmer from the crazy world of Arthur Brown. This was after discussions to form a band with several people including Jimi Hendrix fell apart. The trio sought out very obscure literature to come up with a completely abstract name. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. It's anyone's guess what that could mean. They were called ELP for short. The band has gone on to have quite an unusual and unexpected influence, being largely forgotten in mainstream music, but an incredible and almost ubiquitous influence in some subcultures, namely the music for video games. While ELP's music is nearly 50 years old by now, I think it has an enduring appeal among younger music fans. It has a certain quality that is yet to be replicated which has led to a small but very dedicated following all these years later. I myself am certainly on the younger side, but I could still see what this music was about. In some ways it's hilariously aged, but in others it's timeless. One thing I think it's safe to say about this band is that they lived for music. I don't know really, I sort of, I've never really been to work you see, so I'd have to, I don't know. I just really just don't know, that's sort of impossible to ask, you know. Like I'm a musician and that's why I like it to stay really. I was a schoolboy before, because I've never been to work. <laughs> I, I probably wouldn't choose a job, I'd commit suicide. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Right out the gate, the band was comprised of incredibly talented and accomplished musicians and performers. It was part of the progressive rock era of music. If you're unaware, that was basically the period of rock music that followed on from the Beatles era, where rock music started to use more than three chords in a song, and songs could last more than three minutes. Before this point, rock and roll and pop were synonymous, and rock was looked down upon by music snobs for being asinine, shallow, vapid, any pejorative you could muster up. Bands like ELP changed this. Well, okay, not really, not for everyone at the very least. Critics hated them, and they ultimately earned a reputation for excess. Music critic Robert Christgau said, These guys are as stupid as their most pretentious fans. To some, you may just hear circus music. But for a number of people, it did break the mold of rock at the time. All three members had a background in rock bands, but there was also a significant influence from both jazz and classical, especially for keyboardist Keith Emerson, who composed much of the music. They introduced jazz and classical to the world of rock and pop, things like the syncopation, the complex chord progressions, and the improvisation. They made rock band covers of pieces by Bartok and Mussorgsky. They certainly weren't the first to do this. In fact, the singer Greg Lake was a part of King Crimson who had a similar fusion approach. You've probably seen the Screaming Red Man album and heard I want to give a little history and brief explanation of their style in the context of their probably most famous and best album, Brain Salad Surgery. The first thing you'll note is the awesome cover. Cool, so this is like the origin of industrial or death metal, right? <laughs> You're in for a pleasant nasty <laughs> you're in for a surprise i'll say that but yes this cover was a piece by the guru of gross himself hr geiger the designer of alien this was one of his first big contributions to pop culture the inside of the album was well it was certainly of its time what with the corny portraits maybe those critics were right about the excess what may not be immediately obvious is the rather, how you'd say, glorious imagery. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, don't believe me? The album's title, Brain Salad Surgery, sounds like some creepy nightmarish sci-fi body horror concept matching the cover until you realize it's a slang for fellatio from a Dr. John song. Not to mention they literally airbrushed out a notably phallic object on the cover. And that is also not to mention, basically all of Geiger's art is at the intersection of sex and horror. Remember, in Alien, the egg was originally supposed to only be one line instead of a cross. And that's something people miss about this. The humor, all the secret little jabs and illusions that aren't immediately obvious, 
The first mistake people make when listening is thinking the creators were completely self-serious and not at all self-aware. Well, does the music match the cover? Yes, but not in the way you'd think. The title track is not on the album. It was released in a later album, so I'm not talking about it. The album proper opened with Jerusalem. Yes, it's a synth cover of that old English hymn. Perhaps now you're starting to get an idea of what these people are about. Already starting off with an interesting fusion of ancient and new, with a very subtle allusion to their English roots. Just kidding, it's about as subtle as a shovel to the face. It's declaratively pompous. The poem it's based on is about how Jesus traveled to England. It's imaginative for sure. This track kind of epitomizes the synthesis of old and new. Obviously it has a singular vocalist as opposed to the typical choir. And the drums as well, invoking both orchestral percussion and post-cloud electro swing. Sorry. Rock. The vocals and drumming are typical of rock. The organ, bells and chimes are obviously very much classical. What's noticeably cutting edge was the introduction of a number of Moog synth textures. Basically the bleep bloop sounds. But back then in the 70s it was more of a wee woo sound. The Moog synthesizer was Emerson's instrument of choice and typically the lead instrument. It was a rock band where most of the songs had no guitar. And Emerson is responsible for quite a significant amount of innovation in synth that goes, I think, quite unappreciated. He could make so many sounds with that thing. It is an apt choice of song as well because the original hymn stands at the crossroads of complexity and accessibility. It has a long intro and fairly complex melody, taking a while before reaching its crescendo. It uses counterpoint. At least, it's complex for a song that's meant to be sung by a huge crowd full of people, likely inside a church, and also to be memorized by an entire country. You'll notice as well just how impeccable their playing was. They never missed a beat, no matter how fast or how complex the music. They were precise. They were perfectionists. This song was supposed to be the single, but then it was banned by the BBC, striking down any chance of that. It was blocked for being sacrilegious or something like that. I'm glad that we live in the modern day, where instead the BBC just wouldn't give them any airtime for not being diverse enough. Next up was Toccata. If you don't know, a Toccata is typically a fast-moving piece in classical music that usually possesses improvisational qualities. This one was based on a piece by Argentinian composer Alberto Ginastera. It was the fourth movement of his first piano concerto. It was the perfect fit for its aggression, for its extensive use of percussion. Not to mention the jump from piano to synth keyboard isn't exactly a Herculean leap. And it gave a great opportunity to introduce a drum solo to their live set. ELP sought permission from the original composer for this track. And when Ginastera actually heard their rendition, all he said was that it was diabolical, which is very apt to describe this piece of music. The keyboard runs from the original are replaced with these demonic artificial sounds. This, like many ELP pieces, is great at building tension. Just in general, they can have this sound like an alarm going off. It's definitely anxiety inducing. There's also the drum solo. This was an example of their early innovation in electronic music. They rigged up the drums to play these preset synth sounds. It's almost like an early drum machine, before even these horrid hexagonal drums from the 80s that played a sample when hit. I can certainly forgive somebody for not getting this track. It's not exactly a sweet melody to the uninitiated listener, but I'm here to hopefully introduce people to this music. I'd invite the listener to imagine what context they'd hear this track in, perhaps as a score for some sci-fi horror movie.
It also fits the theme of the album as well. This artificial horror, sci-fi, the robot apocalypse. I think this is a good approach to understanding really any type of music whose appeal isn't immediately obvious. Although I showed movie scenes, there's likely another thought that at least some of you had to have had while listening. This sounds like a video game, like Final Fantasy, like Pokemon even. And yes, that's no mistake. Of course, others might find this comparison ridiculous, but there is a hint of truth to it. I'll get to that, don't worry. Next is Still You Turn Me On. This is certainly turning out to be an eclectic mix because now we have an acoustic ballad. This is effectively a love song wedged in the middle of this aggressive rock music. It's really just Lake with a little bit of Emerson, but it's not that simple. The lyrics are a bit vague, Many of the band's lyrics are more imagistic. It's more about the image and feeling that it evokes. The references to the man on the moon and crystallized flesh may also elicit a double take, but it, it does fit the theme. It is impressive that he flawlessly plays all these arpeggios and sings all while chewing gum. And it isn't exactly the simplest chord progression ever. These popular ballads perhaps give a false idea of the band, but they did contribute to its commercial success. I think there is a certain kind of humor that most people miss when looking at this music as well. Critics thought they were pretentious, perhaps because they thought ELP was self-important in presenting everything to be taken at face value. That line about someone get me a ladder almost feels like their way of laughing at the critics who think they're trying to hide some arcane, esoteric meaning, while also making the point that the music matters the most. The actual meaning is secondary. Next is Benny the Bouncer, and this track doubles down on this exact point. It's a ragtime song performed with, guess what, a Moog synth. What else would it be? You shouldn't really come out of this track thinking, what did they mean by this? It's a rag, a syncopated march. They did this ragtime music because, well, it's fun. There isn't much else to it, and there doesn't need to be. It's not like they didn't do anything with it. Keith Emerson got to do a bit of improvisation. Greg Lake gave a fairly original vocal performance with this aggressive Cockney accent. A complete contrast to the previous song and the humor. The lyrics are funny. They weren't trying to pretend to be anything. It's clear that they did this because they loved the music. The next track is the real centerpiece, the most important part of the album. Carnival 9. It's a three-piece track split between three impressions. The uh, four, really. The first part is split across the disc. In fact, it's quite genius because when the record was flipped over, the B-side would open with Welcome Back My Friends. Yes, records. A lost relic from the boomer age. Archived by many a mustachioed, avocado toast-eating, millennial scholar of music. But anyway, what's the context of that Welcome Back My Friends line in the first impression? Well, it's presented from the ringmaster of a carnival, hence Carn Evil. The nine's just there because it's sci-fi. The theme of this song is basically a technological apocalypse where robots have taken over and conquered humanity. There's this crass, crude and humiliating event, the Khan Evil, that serves as the centerpiece where all sorts of depravities are shown off. The whole thing is really an exercise in musical maximalism. It starts off with some riffing on the organ, slowly building in counter melodies. By the time the band is at full force, it's pretty hard to believe they're making all this noise with three people. It feels like an orchestra. It's largely in 4-4, but it changes to several other time signatures throughout the whole piece. And they play all of this with absolute precision, at a blazing speed. In some shows they actually exceeded 200 BPM. Yes, they went faster live. 
And I don't mean fast and loose, faster and precise. People talk about the drugs musicians took to come up with all this creative music, but it should be no surprise that the drug Emerson admitted to using was cocaine. No sane, sober person could do this day in and day out on a world tour with no stimulation at all. The second part is a jazz instrumental with no lyrics, but it fits snugly between the first and third parts. It builds an incredible sense of tension and motion, constantly changing tempo and time signature. This is the perfect build-up to the third impression, kind of escalating the drama, letting you fill in the blanks between the other parts. For me, it creates a sense of intrigue, like plans are being put in place for what will ultimately transpire in the third piece. This approach of letting the listener fill in the blanks is quite opposed to their reputation for excess. Unlike most modern prog, or even much of modern guitar music in general, ELP understood dynamics. They understood slowing down and taking a break. They understood stepping back. If only the critics that disparaged ELP for their extravagance could have seen what the future held for music. The second impression slows down quite noticeably, really testing Mozart's quote. The music is not in the notes, but in the silence between. There is a fantastic example of this in the first impression, when the music stops briefly for the word shocks. Of course, to shock the audience, get their attention, but it's inverted. Instead of suddenly surprising them with a loud sound, it briefly stops the full-on playing to kind of punctuate it. This was the moment that sold me on the song. The third impression is the epic conclusion, the anthem. Similarly intricate and bombastic as the previous pieces. It has all the organ solos, the counterpoint. This one tells of the great war between man and machine and the triumph of man over the machines. They'd have this giant computer on stage to represent the computer's voice in the song doesn't quite stack up to stabbing his piano, flying spinning piano, or cannons, but it works. The theme of this album should be pretty clear by now. Again, it's not some super serious poem. They have a sense of humour with lines like They know it's overblown. That's the appeal. That's why it's fun. Do I really have to explain why spinning pianos and things exploding on stage are entertaining? I think it very clearly doesn't detract from the musician's ability to play. I think it is important to note the depiction of a dystopia. It's one where sex and horror are intertwined, like Geiger's work. Where others, like Orwell, depict dystopia as sterile. Where sex is completely outlawed. This is a dystopia like a clockwork orange. It's crude, it's crass, and humiliating. Where sexual innuendo is in your face 24-7. Alongside attractions like a real blade of grass, you have seven virgins and a mule. According to Greg Lake, it was prophetic. And I predict that it won't be so long before computers have almost a genetic capacity for knowing their owners. And the more control it would take, the more of your life it would consume. As the first step along the way, we've already become cell phone dependent. On the one hand, he's a boomer complaining about phones. On the other, he's not wrong. The themes of this are still relevant today. They covered this theme of robot domination before Terminator. They weren't the first to do this, but they played at least a small part in popularizing this theme in media. There are still plenty of people who think tech will solve every social issue, developing nightmarish solutions to everyday problems. Now that I've hopefully painted a picture, how about we discuss the influence of this music? It's common knowledge that punk killed prog. That's why progressive rock isn't a thing anymore. But is that really true? I mean, in 1969, King Crimson was the most original and innovative band in the world. Within a mere five years, by 1974, the lead guitarist Robert Fripp considered King Crimson to be musical dinosaurs. I think it's more so a case of knowing when to move on. 
when the ethos of your movement is progressing, you can't exactly keep making the same stuff forever. And it's not like they just went away. I mean, the drama for Genesis got up one day and decided he wanted to be inescapable for an entire decade. At least nowadays, unlike punk, you don't get balding middle-aged men in outdated fashion talking about true prog and how prog's not dead. Okay, maybe you kind of do, but at least they're not trying to pretend they're still cool or with it. There's also this charge of being pretentious. Remember what Chris Gow wrote? Greg Lake said of the critics, the journalist would slag us and the people decided who they liked. If that isn't based, then nothing is. I don't even think they were pretentious. Were they trying to claim some kind of sophistication or importance that they didn't really have? No, they were clearly just having fun. It was music for music's sake, and they lived for the music. I'll tell you what is pretentious, music critics. Music critics who claim to be the arbiters of art, who claim that Johnny Ramone is the 28th greatest guitarist ever, like down picking and playing like shit as some kind of innovation. That punk is some deep political statement, who say that prog is the whitest genre ever, because white, is not right. And anyway, if prog is white, then punk is the fucking albino from the Da Vinci Code. Prog hasn't really seen a continuation in the musical mainstream, outside of different pastiches, which ironically do not progress very much at all. But I think it has been absorbed into the culture in spirit. It affects the broader zeitgeist in a much deeper way. It has maintained an enduring appeal among dedicated musicians, both young and old. And of course, it's significant influence on the world of video game music. Yes, it has taken a very long time to get around to the point of this video, but I think that's pretty apt to do on a video about ELP. Koji Kondo is probably the most influential video game composer of all time. The composer of Mario, The Legend of Zelda, and Star Fox. Also, a huge fan of ELP, apparently. I mean, it makes sense. Think of the medium. Film scores are notably influenced by composers such as Holst, noted for their pomp and bombast, fitting the epic scale of Hollywood. More recently, the influence of composers such as Hans Zimmer, inventor of the blaring synth foghorn. That horn is seen enduring appeal due to the nature of modern cinema sound systems. It's satisfying to feel your seat rumble as the world around you fills with bass. Early games had different limitations. They had to generate sound with 8-bit audio chips. All the sounds were synthesized. They had to bring all the epic qualities of classical music to a synthesized format. It had to be exciting and modern as well. It certainly benefited from a rock music style of presentation with the percussion and everything. Given all these factors, what other band would have been a better fit? And all of that is not to mention the simple fact that ELP are huge in Japan, where all these early influential games were made. Koji Kondo was not the only one. Nobuo Uematsu, composer of Final Fantasy. This inspiration is more obvious when you listen to his work. Just this influence alone is enough. Because through the effects ELP had on these foundational pillars in game music, their influence reaches further downstream to all those who are influenced by these original game composer. But it doesn't stop there. Dark Souls has an NPC named Tarkus, one of ELP's earlier albums. Although that might be from Jojo, who still got it from ELP anyway. Another figure I know to be influenced by ELP is Marty O'Donnell, composer of the Halo soundtrack. I was actually lucky enough to ask him about this personally. Okay, yeah, yeah, ELP was a huge influence. Because I grew up being classically trained and sort of sneaking in, uh, listening to rock and roll and pop music, you know, when my parents weren't paying attention. So I was pretty snobby as, as a kid when it came to music. But when ELP came out, I was at the perfect age. They were playing versions of Bela Bartok and Mazorski. Keith Emerson was a classically trained musician. And so I could play this at full volume in front of my mom and say, look, it's Bartok. 
Music like ELP helped bridge the gap between generations, between music snobs and popular music, between old and new. Now, I feel like I need to cover this final note to properly elucidate on this topic. I have to mention that, unfortunately, this story resolves in a more tragic way. All music comes and goes. Keith Emerson continued to play songs for his most dedicated fans over the years. Even as his band waned in relevance in the mainstream, he lived for music. However, over the years, he developed nerve damage within his hands that affected his ability to play. You can start to hear the pain in his later performances. He suffered from alcoholism and depression at the time. By 2016, he was very concerned about his ability to live up to his fans' expectations and was anxious about upcoming concerts and whether he'd even be able to continue performing. In a truly heartbreaking event, he committed suicide in March 2016. Greg Lake would pass away later in the same year. This is why it's important to uphold good art and pass it on to the next generation. I myself am a part of that next generation, and I am grateful to the people who were fans at the time for their dedication in helping younger people discover this music and help people like Keith Emerson live on through their art. Van Gogh was unsuccessful in his lifetime and died poor of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. But over time, the dedicated sought to preserve his work and share it with the world in hopes that a day will come when the rest of the world understands what they are about, that they truly see their day to shine. Thank you all for watching and goodbye. Right out the gate, the band was comprised of incredibly talented and accomplished museum. Right out- <laughs> Museums. Fuck. <laughs>